grace and peace to you from our God and, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a joy and a privilege it is to share with you again. I am Dr. Lance Watson, and I want to welcome all of you today. This is The Bridge, a weekly part of the teaching ministry of the St. Paul's Baptist Church in Central Virginia where I am blessed to serve. If this is your first time, give us the opportunity to greet you by texting the word NEW, N-E-W, to 804-643-4769. If you are streaming on Facebook, let me direct your attention to the box up top on your homepage that asks the question, what's on your mind? If you click the three dots at the bottom of that box, a drop down menu will allow you to check in. Please check in. That lets us know that you are here. And then if you'd be so kind, click share at the bottom of that box to share this stream with others now. If you're on YouTube, welcome please press the subscribe button so you can get a notif and turn your notifications on so you can get a notification every time we go live. And then we ask that you would also share this stream with some of your family and friends. Now, would you take a minute right now, shout somebody out by name in the chat space, just say hello and don't forget as we study, to hit like if you like something, to share your comments, your questions, your emojis in the chat space. Every week, without fail, we produce a student outline that's designed to help you both track along with us as we study and then to discuss this lesson later with your family and friends. There are links in the chat space on social media where you can download it directly or you can download our free mobile app, and I hope you will. My SPBC APP available free in any of your app stores, or you can text those letters, my SPBC APP to 1833-269-1388, and you can download it that way. Finally, we appreciate and solicit your financial support. We thank you in advance for your generosity to give. You can visit our website at myspbc.org. You can click on the give button there, or you can text letters SPBCCRE to that same number, 1833-269-1388 and download our PushPay app. That's our online gift distributor. Your gifts make our ministry possible. To view just a snapshot of all the ways we find needs and meet them, find problems and solve them, find hurts and heal them, visit our website at myspbc.org backslash outreach. Now go ahead and download our outline, get your Bible, decide how you want to take notes as we prepare to continue our study in the book of Ephesians, a crash course in Christianity. But first, let us pray. We give you all praise, all honor, and all glory, O oh God, for you are worthy to be praised. Bless us as we study together in your name. Bless that person who stands in the need of prayer most. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to tag this teaching today, what's on your prayer list? And we're focused on Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. So go there as I read it in your hearing. These are the words of Paul to the Christians at Ephesus. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
What's on your prayer list? Of course, Samuel L. Jackson has a series of commercials with, sure, with which I'm sure you're familiar that he did for Capital One that all eventuate with the same question. He says, it's a credit card commercial, what's in your wallet? Today, I wanna to borrow that format to talk about prayer and ask you, what's on your prayer list? Because perhaps you have the same problem that I do from time to time. Sometimes as I pray, my mind wanders. If I'm talking to you, just type me too, Pastor. As I begin to make petition for my family, my church, my friends, the nation, the world, as I begin to think about all of those things, I get pictures in my mind and what began so properly and spiritually ends up being a stroll down various lanes of thoughts or even worse, a frenetic run through all of the things I'm worried about. I have discovered I need a prayer list. What about you? If you've ever done that, don't be too hard on yourself because it happens sometimes to the very best. Even that articulate apostle whose name was Paul. Admittedly, his lapse was much more spiritual than mine has ever been, but nevertheless, it was a lapse. And it's right here in Ephesians 3. He began to dictate a prayer. Look at verse one. It's in verse one of chapter three, only to be sidetracked by his busy mind regarding the mystery of the church in verses two through 13. And then he returns to his prayer here in verse 14. Now, this is very apparent if you read verses one and 14 together. Listen to it. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, then in verse 14, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Perhaps there were times when Paul needed a prayer list too. Be that as it may, Paul is now fully engaged in a prayer for what he called God's masterpiece, God's masterwork. You and I, the church of Jesus Christ, or the third race, as we have been calling it over the last couple of weeks, this is one of the most beautiful and oft-quoted prayers in all of scripture, especially in reference to the width and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. The incomparable Charles Simeon of Cambridge, the founder, some say, of the evangelical movement in the Church of England, took these, what he called, four magnitudes as his life verse and virtually died with them on his lips. The prayer itself has been the text of countless expositions and exegetical works. Alexander McLaren, a great Scottish preacher of yesteryear, had six sermons on this one text. The prayer is uniquely beautiful, but what has made it the subject of so many expositions and sermons is that it is a prayer for us, for the church of Jesus Christ. The opening statement, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, may not get our attention, especially if kneeling is a regular part of our prayer discipline. But in fact, it is remarkable when you consider it in context. Here's why. It was not customary for Jews or Hebrews to kneel in prayer. You need to write that down. I bet you've never heard that before. Their ordinary posture when praying was standing, just as we see pious Jews doing today before the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, where they are rocking back and forth as they intone and sing and articulate their prayers. Kneeling for them indicated an extraordinary event or an unusual passion. You need look no further than 2 Chronicles 6, 13. For example, when King Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple, he knelt on a wooden platform before all the people and lifted his hands to heaven in prayer. In Mark chapter 14, verses 35 and 36, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the eve of his death, Jesus fell to the ground in agonizing emotion as he prayed to Almighty God. In Acts chapter 20, verses 36 through 38, 
It says, and when Paul made his tearful goodbye to the elders at Ephesus, he knelt with them and prayed. Here, Paul pens his immortal prayer with unusual passion and emotion for at least two discernible reasons. And you might want to write these down. There's space on your outline. First, because of the stunning impact upon himself of the immense revelation that he has been delivering by the power of God. How beautiful it is to see a man go to his knees because of the word of God. Somebody said that he who bends his knees before God will not have to bend them before anybody else. That's a word right there. This is a message for all of us who are preachers and teachers and expositors of the word. How easy it is for us to be like a railroad conductor who after daily shouting out destinations imagines that he has been there himself, but actually has no idea what really lies beyond his own words. Or like a chef who spends all day cooking for others, but never samples the food themselves. It is also a message for all of those who listen to Paul's prayer with a whole hum, whatever kind of attitude. But secondly, the apostle is on his knees in profound emotion, stunning impact of revelation that he is delivering upon himself and others, but also in profound emotion, he says, before the father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. When my wife and I have time to talk about important things, the first topic we often talk about is our children and our grandchildren. We discuss what's happening in each of their lives. We relate to each other the conversations that we have had with them. We do some maternal and paternal bragging. We congratulate each other on how brilliant our grandchildren are. And we mention our prayer concerns. What's the point? We have a special love for those who are our own. They are our joy and they know it, they sense it. So it was, my friends, with Paul's realization of his relationship with Almighty God, the God of the third race, of the entire human race. Paul knew he was loved and thinking about that love put him on his knees. Paul had fallen to his knees because of two realities. First, the sublime truth of God's word, and second, the soul-healing parenthood under which he rested. The realization now springs forth in three major petitions for the new humanity. He prays for strength, for love, and for fullness. Say that for me, strength, love, fullness. Let's look at them. First of all, a prayer for strength in verses 16 and 17. He prays for their strength. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may watch this strengthen you with power through his spirit. Where? In your inner being. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The main idea is this, that just as the ill or infirm need to be strengthened so that they can take in all that life has to offer, so also people of faith, children of God, need to be inwardly strengthened in order to receive all the blessings that God desires for us to have. Paper bags are not thick containers for valuable jewels. This is also logical if you have been following Paul's exposition of the wonderful things that God wants to do for those who are his own. The immensity of what God wants to do in your life and mine makes us see our own inadequacy and ought to drop us to our knees in prayer and praise. As Stuart Briscoe, who for years led the Elmbrook Church in Wisconsin remarked, we need to be like the little boy who was heard to say when he fell into a barrel of molasses, Lord, make my capacity equal to this opportunity. You got to grab that. There are two elements here. One is derived from God's wealth. Everybody say God's wealth. Look at verse 16 and notice that Paul says, I pray that 
out of, literally according to or in accord with his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. It is futile to come to a broke person with a financial request, no matter how moving or urgent or passion your appeal may be, but to come before the one from whom are all things and to whom are all things, according to Romans eleven thirty six, gives us a great source of optimism, especially when he is no mere John D. Rockefeller, who sometimes gave from his riches, but rather he is one who gives according to his riches. And there's a difference. Giving from and giving according to gives according to his riches on the scale and in the style of the wealth of his glory. Such are the resources from which God strengthens you and I. God doesn't just give us from his riches, meaning breaking you off a little piece, but God gives you according to his riches, meaning out of the wealth of God's abundance in all dimensions, at all times, in all places, God makes available to you and I resources. Somebody ought to type right there, I have all I need by the grace of God. But the other element in our strengthening is the agency of the Holy Spirit in our inner being. I need about 41 of you right now to type, God is in me. Paul prays, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, when he writes, therefore, we do not lose heart. That's somebody's word today. Therefore, we do not lose heart. You don't fall apart. You don't panic. You don't give up. You don't throw in the towel. Why? Though outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly we being renewed day by day. The Holy Spirit of God orchestrates the endowment of the strength, which is freely given to us according to the scale of divine riches. We are renewed and empowered for life in life, and we grow stronger and stronger, even while our bodies may grow old and frail and feeble. We are frail containers pulsating with divine power. In this way, we become full of Christ. He dwells in our hearts richly through faith. This is a beautiful upward spiral. Our capacity is strengthened according to his riches so that we can appropriate more of his life. His life then fills us and enlarges our capacity so that we can hold more of him within. And so it goes onward and onward, upward and upward with Christ. This prayer for inner strengthening was not a mere wish, but the petition of the apostle Paul for the entire church. It is my prayer for myself. It is my prayer for the church I serve. It is my prayer for all of you. So he starts with a prayer for strength. He continues in verses 17 through 19 with a prayer for love. Everybody say love. Paul goes on to pray for love. Listen to what he says. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. You got to get this, that opening expression. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love is a prayer for a lifestyle of love. We are to live a lifestyle of love. And again, Paul mixes the metaphors. Rooted is agricultural. Did you get that? It's agricultural. Established or more literally rendered founded is architectural. So one picture is agricultural and the second picture is architectural, but their significance is perfectly parallel. Like trees, that's agricultural, our lives are to send down roots deep and wide into the soil of love. But like 
buildings, the edifices of our lives, the things we build here on earth are to have deep, solid foundations built on love. If we are properly rooted and properly constructed on a foundation of love, hear me well, nothing will ever be able to shake us. Years ago, Dr. Donald Barnhouse pointed out that love is intrinsic to all the fruit of the spirit listed in Galatians 5.22. This is so good. I put it in your outline. He said, love is the key. Joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. Long suffering is love enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's self-forgetfulness. Self-control is love holding the reins. It's all about love. That sounds like earth, wind, and fire, don't it? There are no fruit of the spirit without love. We must be rooted, agricultural, and founded, architectural, in love with all the depth and profundity of both of those metaphors. Paul praised this because relational love is absolutely crucial to the viability and ministry of those who name the name of Jesus Christ. His call for us is to go beyond superficiality. Somebody type, get beyond that. See, we must send our roots down, that's agricultural, down, 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 and far into the love of God. There is nothing static here. Love must grow on, not just go on, grow on until the grave, when of course, it will fully bloom. And having prayed for a lifestyle of love, Paul then turns his focus upward to the vertical love of Christ, praying for believers' mental comprehension of all of its dimensions. And I pray, I'm in the Bible, that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp, that's a mental concept, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Why are there so many people of faith who are starved for love? It's because we haven't been taught just how much God loves us. God loves us and that we are to accept and receive his love by faith is a principle and a premise that needs to be reiterated over and over again. Statistics report and say that approximately one out of every four adult women in our nation are molested between the ages of five and 15. That is a tragedy. And what is coming out now is that the number of men who are molested as boys in that same age range between five and 15 has grown at an alarming rate as well. Countless others who have not been sexually abused have been tragically physically abused, beaten by drunken parents and drugged parents, by uncaring step parents and by exhausted and impatient grandparents. Those who are not physically or sexually abused have often been emotionally deprived. They have grown up in situations in which they were never fully certain that they were loved or valued or cherished or wanted or appreciated. The church puts up a sign and says, all hurting people are welcome here. But when those broken, hurting, wounded, tattered, and torn people who have never known or felt the unconditional love of a human being come walking through our front doors or showing up on our computers, often the first thing the church does is tell them the rules of their doctrine, the rules of their tradition, the words to our songs and the commandments that God expects us to obey. We rarely, and this is a tragedy, wrap our arms around the broken, wounded, and the loveless, and hurting, and say, God loves you, and I do too. That's why I made that a mantra in our ministry. There's not a Sunday that goes past that we don't say to each other, I love you, and there ain't a thing you can do about it, because we are, as people of faith, to lead with love. Everything is rooted in love. That's agricultural and built on love. That's architectural. 
It's all about love. The wounded in our midst rarely open up to bear their secrets for fear of being rejected, ostracized, separated, and left out in the woodshed again. They may even participate in the life of the church as teachers and choir members and ushers and dancers and tutors and actors, but deep down inside, the church is often filled with the walking wounded, people who are bleeding, hurting, aching on the inside. And the only thing, hear me well today, that can ever satisfy that longing, that pain in their heart and spirit is the unconditional, infinite, unending love of God. Hurt people hurt people. You ought to write that down. That explains why people experience hurt in the church, because the church is filled with hurting people. Now, that's the right place for them to be, because the church is a hospital. Everybody in there is sick from something. The only difference that distinguishes us is some of us are regularly taking our medication. Some of us have gotten stitched up while others still need to be in the ER. I say that to you in love. If it fits, wear it. It's like a Cinderella shoe. Look, the breadth and length and depth and height of the love of God is what people need most and often what they receive the least. We bring hurting people to Jesus and we tell them that God will be your heavenly father, but often their only image of father is linked to abuse. We say to them, welcome to our family, but often their only image of family is where they have been rejected and alienated. We teach them about authority, but often their only image of authority has been stained with previous pain. We teach them to submit to teachers and mentors, but often in their hearts, submission is linked to a total lack of value and, uh, and a value and love. Those who have been wounded by their fathers and mothers, whether sexually, physically, emotionally, mentally, are people who are often afraid of God. They fear the presence of God. They fear God knowing their innermost thoughts. They fear that God, like their parents, will never love them completely. They fear that they'll never be good enough, clean enough, strong enough, talented enough, or valuable enough to be accepted by God and to the kingdom of God. Because anytime a child does not know that their parents love them, they are destined to struggle with some type of dysfunction. And that's why I think Paul prayed here. I pray that you might know the love of God. If you don't know anything about eschatology, if you don't know anything about Christology, if you don't know anything about uh, demonology or cosmonology or any of those ologies, right? Any theology at all. Paul said, I pray that you might know the love of God. This is a love that will blow your mind because it's beyond anything that we know or comprehend. It cannot be compared to anything that we grew up with, experienced in the past, or married to, or have even have given birth to. The love that God has for you, my friend, is infinite pure, infinitely accepting, infinitely present, infinitely kind, infinitely generous, infinitely more than any other kind of love. Here's my grandma. It's so high, you can't get over it. It's so low, you can't get under it. It's so wide, you can't get around it. It's so deep, you can never get to the bottom of it. And what you cannot fathom with your mind, you can never exhaust in your life. The love of God must be accepted by faith. How do you know that? In the same way we accept the salvation of our souls by faith, we choose to believe with our will that God is true to his word and that God's nature is love and that we are in Christ. Ephesians 1, 6, we are his beloved. And then we look where? Not just to the church, but more so to the cross. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross is the ultimate expression of the love of God. He was and is God's only begotten son. And to show us how much he loved us, God required his son to extend his arms on the cross. An invitation that says, if you want to know how much I love you, this 
is how much I love you. John tells us this and his well-known verse in John 3, 16, you know it, quote it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that includes you, you in that crowd believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans 5, 8, Paul expressed it this way. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We don't and can't earn God's love, but God gives it to us through Jesus Christ. He loves us because God desires and chooses to love us. We experience God's love only as we accept all that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and open our hearts to him in faith. In 1 John 4, 19, the apostle John also wrote, we love him because he first loved us. He gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice for us. First John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. The love of God, my friends, is not something we can acquire simply by knowing. You've got to experience it. Come on, I need about 40 of you to type in the chat space, get some of this, which is made possible through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. In Romans 5, 5, Paul wrote to the Romans, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which has been given to us. It is the Holy Spirit who convinces us of God's love, infuses us with God's love, and who causes us to experience God's love. The fruit of the Spirit, don't miss this point, is first and foremost, love. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I say this for contrast because our text calls for us to consider the infinite love of Christ. Four magnitudes, the width, the length, the height, and the depth, they are all poetic expressions of the infinitude of God's love. And we have to be careful not to be too fanciful about these as St. Augustine and St. Ambrose have been in church literature. And nevertheless, these dimensions can be said to suggest, write this down, a love that is wide enough to embrace the world. Again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. But secondly, a love that is long enough to last forever. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, as Charles Spurgeon once said, it is so long that your old age cannot wear it out. Hallelujah. So long that your continual trouble can never exhaust it. Hallelujah. So long that your successive temptations cannot drain it dry. Hallelujah. So long that eternity itself will know no bounds for it. Thirdly, it's a love that's high enough to take every sinner to heaven. Read 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And then fourthly, it's a love that's deep enough to take Christ to the lowest depths to reach every person. He descended, he made himself, according to Philippians 2, 5, of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death even the death on the cross. These four magnitudes describe an infinite, incomprehensible love. That famous writer, A.W. Tozer, once wrote, because God is self-existent, his love had no beginning. Because God is eternal, his love has no end. Because God is infinite, his love has no limit. Because God is holy, it is the quintessence of all spotless purity. Because God is immense, his love is incomprehensibly vast, bottomless, shoreless as the sea. Christ's love for us, and if this don't shout you, nothing will, is indeed incomprehensible. But Paul prays for our growing comprehension that we may have the power, together with all the saints, to grasp its dimensions, literally take hold of them and seize them. He knows it's impossible, and yet he calls us to this grand spiritual exercise for the health and well-being of our souls. It is to be 
our life's occupation? Have we seriously devoted time to thinking about and trying to understand the immensity of God's love through Christ for us? Have you ever contemplated his love? For example, in what God did through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, through the cross of Jesus Christ. Great passages like this one, which extol his love. Have you ever spent time thinking about them? If not, can I suggest you get on the job, that you not neglect your duty? But, and here is the key, this is not to be our solitary, individualistic, isolated occupation, because Paul says we are to do it together with all the saints. We can only come to a better, fuller knowledge of the love of Christ in community. And that's why there's no such thing as a solo saint. So if you mad at the people in the church, get over it, get past it, get back in the fellowship, let God grow you a little bit, heal you a little bit, because you can never be all you wanna be by yourself as a singular saint. This happens as we sit under the teaching and preaching of the word of God. It happens as we study together, like we're doing on this platform, as we discuss it, like I suggest to you every week. It happens when we share our knowledge of God's love with each other. It happens as we observe other brothers and sisters who have gone through more that we have ever gone through, and yet they are growing and moving on. It happens as our hearts go upward in our worship of Almighty God. We need each other in order to comprehend the love of Christ and the word of Christ. There's one last request by Paul regarding love, and that is for an experiential love of Christ. It's at the beginning of verse 19, and to know this love, that surpasses knowledge. Again, the language is confusing because you cannot personally know what is beyond knowledge. Did you hear me? You cannot know what is beyond knowledge. However, Paul suggests you can experience it. This knowing is not just in the intellect, but it's in the heart. Samuel Rutherford wrote from prison in Aberdeen, Love, love, I mean, Christ's love is the hottest cold that I have ever felt. Oh, but the smoke of it be hot. Cast all the sea salt on it, it will flame. Hell cannot quench it. Many waters will never quench the love of Christ. But those who have not experienced this love, no words will ever suffice. For those who have experienced his love, no words will ever do. Paul prays also a prayer for fullness. Everybody listening, type fullness. This is his final petition for the family of faith in verse 19b, that we will be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is a staggering thought, for this fullness is the fullness with which God fills divinity itself. How can we understand this? Well, some parallel scriptures come to our rescue. For example, for God was pleased to have all his fullness to dwell in Christ. That's Colossians 1.9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. That's Colossians 2.9 and 10. How does this work? Well, the answer can best be understood by way of illustration. Several years ago, I stood with my wife on the shore of the Pacific Ocean, a finite dock, two finite docks alongside a seemingly immense expanse. And as we stood there, I reflected that if I were to take a pint jar and allow the ocean to rush into it, in an instance, my little jar would be filled with the fullness of the Pacific. But of course, I could never put the fullness of the entire Pacific Ocean in my jar. Did you follow it? I could only hold of the Pacific what my jar had the capacity to hold. And so it is with God, because God is infinite, because Christ is infinite. He can hold the fullness of the deity. But whenever one of us, as finite creatures, dip our tiny jar of life in him. We instantly become full of his fullness, but we don't have all of his fullness. We can always 
open to hold more and more of his fullness. And the more we receive of his fullness, the more we have yet to receive, not because it's not available, but because we are not capable. We have to grow in our capacity. And this will be our experience in all of eternity, the ultimate elevation of our souls. That's what the songwriter meant when he said, when we've been there, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise, experience God's love, know God's mercy than when we have first began. We will be loaded with the fullness of God, integrated more and more into his fullness. What a prayer this is. Within this amazing torrent of devotion, Paul has prayed for strength. He has prayed for love. He has prayed for fullness. This is high theology, and this is typical of Paul's thoughts and prayers. But there is one more thing which is also characteristic, and that is his high theology always becomes doxology. Don't miss that. That theology always becomes doxology. What are you trying to say? It always becomes praise. And that's how he ends this prayer. Listen, now to him who is able, stop. God is able. What is he able to do? Immeasurably more. Hallelujah. And we ask or imagine, how does he do it? According to the power that is at work within us, to him, to God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The God whom Paul makes these requests to has a capacity that exceeds our capacity of even asking or imagining. Let your mind dwell on that for a moment. To this great God, Paul invokes glory. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He piles synonym on top of synonym to emphasize an eternity of glorifying God, one age, super intervening upon another into remotest infinity, literally unto all the generations of the ages on top of the ages. Amen. We, the church, people of faith, though remaining finite, will keep on expanding in our capacity to bring glory to God throughout all eternity. With this exuberant, exultant note, the first section of Ephesians ends, and the amen may well be the congregation's loud affirmation as it was read to them. We have learned here that there are three things that we must put on our prayer list. I know you thought I forgot my title. What's on your prayer list? Paul said, put a prayer for an inner strengthening so as to enhance our capacity to hold what God has for us. Here it is in a sentence. God, expand my capacity. Number two, what's on your prayer list? Put a prayer for love so that our practical lives will be rooted in love, will be rooted, that's agricultural, and founded or established, that's architectural, so we will further understand and experience the unfathomable love of God. Here's the prayer, God, expand my love. Or as the Bee Gees used to say, and more recently, P.J. Morton, how deep is your love? Here's the third prayer. It ought to be a prayer for ever-growing fullness in this life and in eternity. God, expand your fullness in me. If we pray this list, my friends, there is ample cause for optimism because of the scriptural promise of 1 John 5, 14. And this is the assurance we have in approaching God that if we ask anything, everybody shout anything, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, come on, say it like you mean it, whatever, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Our optimism, our positivity comes because Paul's Ephesian prayer is God's revealed will. And therefore, if we pray for its three grand emphases, if these three things are on your prayer list, 
we will receive them. What's on your prayer list today? I pray that these three are and that you will pray them continually and let God enlarge your capacity. Here's my question to start off our discussion today. Have you ever received the exact gift you wanted for your birthday, Christmas, or anniversary wish list? What was it? Tell somebody about it and start this conversation today about your prayer list and what God might want you to have on it. I pray that you will. I pray that these lessons bless you. That's why we take the time to share them every single week, because we want to bless you and we want you to be a blessing to somebody else. So before you scroll away, before we say amen, would you click that share button and share this stream with at least one other person? Invite them. Say, Pastor's teaching, boy, from the book of Ephesians every single Thursday night. We're walking step by step, line upon line, precept upon precept, section upon section through the book of Ephesians so you can get a deep understanding of what it was God was trying to communicate through the apostle in this crash course on Christianity. You will not be the same. In fact, receive this blessing now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or think according to the power that is at work within you. Unto him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Until next time, I'm Dr. Lance Watson.